has two baseball diamonds and a park and a tennis court. Why don't you report um, putting these bike lanes in up transportation? There's going to be you know, easily a thousand more people, and that's not being looked at. The concern that I have is I want. I went to Michael's today, by bus, to see how long it would take. Driving, it took me eight and a half minutes. By bus, it took me an hour and five minutes. That's just to get That's from the money should go. Lord Markland to Michael's on the door of Queen. Your transportation is not good. You have to get that up before you get rid of roads by all out of the bicyclists. That's what I want to say. Thank you, Denise. I think the sentiment well shared. Uh, even those in the cycle uh, are sensitive to the congestion and difficulty moving in anything other than our regular. Yeah. Hi, how's it going? My name's Alvin McCray. I, uh, I live in the area, but I don't own a house, so it doesn't really affect me, but I'm just genuinely curious as to what was the rationale behind this. Um, I'm a general contractor. I need my vehicle to work. I often have to go to Home Depot and get materials, and that's doubled, tripled in time. Um, obviously that cost gets passed on to the homeowner. Um, it gets passed on to my subs, which are then passed on to the homeowner in the end. So I'm wondering, have you guys actually taken the consideration and time to think about people that are self-employed and might be charging all these people here that own homes? <laughs> I have plumbers, I have HVAC guys, none of them want to work in this area anymore, and if they do, they're charging a premium. So what do you have to say to all these people that are getting charged up the ass right now? Thank you. I mean, thank you, right? Thank you for me, but... Albert, I, I, I'm glad you raised the point, because many of us take the simple lens of, well, it's just a personal tie. But if you dig deeper into it, there are economic impacts to people that are simply paying workers to sit in traffic. Uh, delivery, delivery of materials, and I mentioned a little bit before, there are economic models that do consider congestion as a contributing factor to the place of housing. Um, I, I wish I could find an easier way, and I appreciate you raising the point because it's part of our minutes that council needs to think about these things. Because livability in the city includes many things, and that is intriguing to me about it. Yeah, with all due respect, I think that's a question for the project manager. She'd be the one that'd be dealing with that, right? Yeah. So what do you have to say to yourself, Mr. Or Mrs. Uh, project Manager? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we could explain how this is going to What was the rationale? Yeah, so again, as Katie highlighted, in the actual network plan, there are nine points of analysis that get to the roots. When we actually evaluate each route, we look at safety, we look at congestion and traffic mobility, we look at Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you want to pass the other way? The frameworks 
starts from a point of equal waiting, but so we're in the process of considering waiting certain criteria based on the input we've received no from the public uh, and from internal and external stakeholders. So it hasn't been formally proposed that certain ones would be weighted higher. That's not one of the nine. <laughs> Can I make the suggestion if unless folks disagree, could we resolve as a group that perhaps council should pay more attention to congestion as one of the nine? suggestions on certain data pieces that are missing, please tell me. And I will work, I, I can assure you, I will work with staff to try to, to bring them. And if I have to go to council to get permission to do so, I am quite happy to do that. I can't promise you maybe they will let me, but I will ask those questions even if they're tough. Thanks. Yeah. I'm sorry, I apologize. No, over this here. side, this side. Other side. Can I skip over here? Yeah. Up there. Thank you very much. <laughs> Go ahead. I can hear you, but I, I, I'm here the mic. Yeah, I, I can speak up if the mic doesn't work. Here we go. I can hear the mic. Justin, okay, yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Andrew Vanderwall. I um, live on a quiet residential street. And we heard some comments about how if you live on a quiet residential street and you have a cycling route that uh, encompasses and takes in that street, there will just be some shells or some painted lines. But my quiet residential street has had the misfortune of being slated for some construction and sewer work, yeah. which was deemed by the city to be a grand opportunity to install a cycle track on our quiet residential street. A complete bollard protected, curb protected, four foot plastic bollards, warning markers, the whole nine yards on our quiet residential street. And by the way, that means that no one can park on either side of that street anymore. All the hundred year old homes that only have a spot for one car cannot park on in front of the residence anymore once this is implemented and construction is beginning next month. So when we are being told that on quiet residential streets you can expect only a few shadows, I can test from our experience that that is not the case. City Council actually approved our street to be uh, changed to a cycle track on June 15th of 2023 with no consultation and, and nothing that all residents who are adamantly and vehemently opposed to this have had absolutely no influence in changing the course of this entirely inappropriate city infrastructure being built on the street. And moreover, when we look at this from the perspective of a cyclist, which I am, I have cycled over 2,000 kilometers every year to and from downtown Toronto from Etobicoke. I am a, a commuter cyclist. I know the needs of cyclists. And being in a, in, a, in, a, in a cycle track, a narrow, constrained area, passing all these driveways with cars backing up that have limited visibility as they try to back up is an extremely hundred place for a cyclist to be. So instead of creating a safer environment on such a quiet residential street, we're actually creating 
hazardous recyclers, yeah. and backing up odorists, and totally this uh, <laughs> Yes, I am, I am raising this as a cautionary because I have been in public role, but in Ward 6. Three. Ward 3. Superior Avenue is a 300 yard stretch of Superior Avenue, and this cycle track is not connected to anything else that is a cycle track. Thank you very much. I'm sure you have a review of the details of that. I'm going to try to take that away from the application to what we're discussing tonight and to the locations. I appreciate the input. Thank you. President of the Community Years of the Kingsway and the Public and Feeding Business Owner for the last 11. In the city's reports on the Burr West Village bike lanes, a very rosy picture is painted of positive impact on local businesses, including references to surveys of businesses that describe increased foot traffic, sales, and so forth. But what's very contrary to that is myself and another business owner pulled 59 businesses along the Kingsway, and of those 57 were willing to sign documents explaining how the impact is negatively impacting their business. There's GPSs that direct people away from Bloor Street, so people are avoiding our businesses. You will have businesses in the neighborhood to enjoy. So I want to understand. I would like to see the city staff supply the relevant details of their survey, including the text you use, who exactly responded. Because it is a mystery to me how we can poll in one day and get 59 businesses to say how they're feeling and how they're impacted, yet you can't give us data that proves that you've actually done your job.
So I'm very, very familiar with the state of Bloor Street um, in that block between Prince Edward and Royal York. And so I see those bike lanes not several times a week. And what's most noteworthy about those bike lanes is an almost complete absence of bicycles. <laughs> non-car transit when you're deciding where to put the bike lanes. So my question is, to whoever cares to answer it, how do we get rid of the damn absolutely knew that there was a train going to be there because of the train. The council knew it was 0.3% of the surface users were cyclists. They knew that. They made the decision. So, uh, let's, 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 let's finish the second half. So, in nine years as being a city councilor, I've seen bike lanes come out once. It was over in Scarborough. The local councillor led that initiative, the council backed them up. The short answer on how to take the bike lanes out is that you have to collect 14 votes out of the 26 to agree to do it. And it's not easy to do. If you've got one here, I'll start with that. Don't. So, uh, I'm going to respect to my colleague, but her vote is on public record, and she did. Thank you. The next question up on the balcony is the balcony. Hi there. My name's uh, Alex Cameron. I'm over on the other side. On your side, on this side. Thank you. Uh, my name's Alex Cameron. I'm also a Ward 3 Superior Avenue. Uh, resident uh, and uh, uh, Councilor Holloway, I just want to really thank you for holding this meeting. We're finding it really difficult to get the city to listen to this. Um, as Andrew already told you, we've got 300 meters of street where they want to put in a divided bicycle, and really all they need to do is uh, put, what they're trying to do is slow down the traffic on the streets. I said, hey, my goodness, why don't you lower the darn speed limit and then put in some speed traps? Uh, so, can, can you? Tell me how to get the national council to the bicycle people pay attention and solve the real problems. Thanks. Thank you. I, uh, the best advice I can give you is to continue to engage with elected officials. You would start with the local councillor. You would branch out to the Eternal for your community council. You can spot who we are easily on the left and then the broader council over there. If I may offer one piece of advice, that is, be very deliberate in the communications to try to explain the problem that you wish to have solved. That's much easier than going straight to the solution. So I, I thank you for that. And it's a question I ask often at City Council. It's a question that I ask on Blue Street. Is we need to be very deliberate about the things that we do to maintain public confidence. And the first question we need to do is define what the problem is that we're trying to solve. I don't think we do that well as a council. And the result of that is what we see you tonight. So I appreciate the comments. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. 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 Thank
and we can discuss what the rules are in that community. Okay, thank you. Um, I think the rotation is good. Uh, this way. Hey, my name is Cody with uh, Donald Sotomayor, and we'll be the initiative. Um, so far, I've uh, been talking with, you know, we have 25,000 residents of the Pilgrim and hundreds of submissions online and videos showing that there is a clear problem with fire respondents, like, and police not being able to get by, and ambulances not being able to get by. Everyone that I talk to that are local, policemen, fire and ambulance drivers, say that there's a significant problem here, and that it's being ignored and not addressed. And yet, again, when we talk about it with the city, again, they say there's no problem for it. So I just want to know, how is that an acceptable answer when there's thousands of residents that are seeing this happen on a regular basis and it's just being completely ignored? And my secondary question is, I'm wondering if it's possible, I did email in uh, a couple of videos, I'm wondering if I could play those so people can see, because there's numerous people in this audience that have sent me videos on these challenges and problems, and we are just being ignored and neglected entirely. So, so, so if, if I may suggest that we play one of them, and maybe somebody else can suggest yeah. another, just so we want to have something. Can we play the 24 hour time lapse one? still waiting for that. We've been asking for data. Adam, you say that it's on the website. It's not there. You can say it all you want, but it's not there. We want to see the actual data. We want to see the actual data. We have, we have now, and we are collecting data. So I would love to see what your data is and see what aligns and what matches. So can we the data regarding monitoring of what has just recently been installed, you're right, is not on the website. We will be posting something soon. What's your definition of soon? What is your definition of soon? I've been told soon for months. What is your definition of soon? They did. They did highlight the other thing. They did. No, they did. They did. I saw. I see. I see. More and more. not going into so you can see on the other side, seven, eight. Yeah. 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 So, when we do projects like this, and specifically on the floor street, we can see extensions like that. We meet regularly with emergency services to get their input on the specific projects. Oh, that's at the edge of what the, 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 the local firemen are saying that's not true. The local police department is saying that's not true. And so are the local ambulances are saying that's not true. So I don't know the actual words. Who are you having this conversation with? Because it's, it's not anybody locally that lives in this area. Like, I, I, I am a cyclist, I go out, I do ride my bike consistently. There's many people that are even part of our organization that are, are, are hardcore cyclists, and we feel this way because it's just, it's just so inappropriate, you know? It is. It's just, it's really Their data collection team. So we don't work with the individual. 
individual ambulance driver that you might have a casual conversation with on the street. They do all. Oh, 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 they have the pulse. Schools are one of them. And we have been doing more engagement, even at the network 
plan level with our colleagues in the school boards and with Green Communities Canada who work with schools on active school travel planning. So we're talking to them about other ways that we can bring a greater focus to connectivity and safety around schools. Uh, and working closely with our colleagues at uh, Vision Zero and those who work on school zone safety plans and um, seeing what kind of partnerships we can have uh, specifically related to schools. Uh, and for Montgomery, um, so at, at this stage we're still, like there's 500 kilometers of candidate groups. They were selected based on that higher level kind of criteria. We're still in the process now of confirming that there are some options that could go forward if selected. Montgomery is one where it's pretty soon, and there are a few different options that could be proposed. Um, from anything of a pink or red lane to you know, the fee separation, it can be on one side of the street but not both. So if Montgomery gets selected, uh, there's actually a few options that would come forward for more detailed engagement with schools uh, on the street and residents in the area. There's a few different ways that uh, play by play could happen. Bike lanes on the Queensway. 
Now, the bike lanes on the Queensway, all you're going to do is cause more and more problems. We have ambulances, fire departments, police department running up and down that Queensway six, seven times a day. Going to Park Lawn, going wherever they have to go, but they're running fast. Now, she's supposed to put bike lanes on there. All you're going to do is affect the businesses. A lot of businesses are struggling now. You guys come up with all this garbage, okay? Right after the pandemic, right after the pandemic, when we were shut down by you guys, okay? So you had enough time to do what? Sit down and say, how can we, you know, make some of these people go out of business? Because that's what you're doing. One, two, the safety. Okay, sorry. All right, I'll show it to you. Don't worry about it. I'll get you guys later. Now, all you're going to end up doing is having a lot more accidents, a lot more, because when you talk about safety, you say safety. What do you mean by safety? You're leaving it up to the drivers to be safe. We are safe. Have you seen some of the bikers that are out on the roads today? They don't have lives, nothing. On the Queensway, they do what they call, I like to say, the Tour de France. They take up the whole lane. Personally, I'd like to run them over to get out of my way. Now you put these bike lanes in, it's going to take you at least another 20 minutes to get home and to work. Easy. I'm on the road. You said most people turn around and drive two days a week. I'm on the road six days a week. I'm in sales. I'm outside. I go see clients all over Toronto, Concord, Hamilton, Burlington. You guys are like trying to make this the city into one of the worst cities ever to live in. Yeah! So if that's the case, the community is to put more in the in Cambodia. Because that's where all the bike lanes are. It doesn't have bike lanes, it just has bikes. Okay, we're really getting tired of paying all these taxes for stupid projects like this. Yeah! We need to stupid, you know, $1.2 billion to the whole. You raise the property taxes by 9.5%, and now you're putting this garbage on us? Yeah! What's going on with the city? I thought politicians had to do like it, but they don't. It's all about your agendas. Trust me, Amber Morley and her agenda. She just put two, what do you call them, electric charging stations in front of our business. That's another useless piece of garbage. Even, even, the, even the guys installing it say it's a waste of money. Anyways, show the guys a 15 second video. I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, politicians should be blasted. And uh, there is no excuse for some of the decisions that are not here. I don't agree with them, but they, they have come this way. Um, I, would, I would say more people need to express these opinions as much as they can. Because the best thing is to get back to the politics. We're here, aren't we? We're you, north. You are, and you're doing a great job. <laughs> so but what else? You've got to convert those votes at council to see it this way. Bring them here! So many times, I feel like things change when you cross the Humber River and you come into a total cup. It just feels like the amalgamation never worked. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Please, please don't lose your identity in, in this mix of a mega city and keep up your voice. We thank you for that. Uh, my name is Kathleen Figuera. I work, I work, no, I don't work. I work south of Florida, off Prince Edward. Uh, the first thing I want to say is Toronto is not Amsterdam. Toronto will never be Amsterdam. Yeah. You can build as many bike lanes as you want, but this city is not, is not Amsterdam. I, as far as corresponding and getting replies back, I wrote to the mayor, I wrote to Amber, and I wrote to Barbara Gray at Transportation. Uh, I got nothing, of course, from the mayor. I got, I can't, I'm not sure I got anything from Amber. I got a very cut and paste reply from Transportation. I had six questions, they answered two of them. I put my name down for 
to get responses on um, what's happening. If there was a link where you could put your email in. I've had nothing in three years, nothing. I know every single firefighter at 431, which is on February. There are 20 of them there. I know every one of them. I know them by name. Okay. And I can tell you, nobody has talked to them about what's going on with the fire engines. I asked them, what are they doing to open their delay? First, are you being delayed? Yes, we're being delayed. We all said, yes, as you've heard, we have to go on the side street. What do you do, because we spoke about response times, what do you do about delay? We have to report in to the platoon chief that when, because they check them, they know where the call is, where is the fire department, they, they, they have to, so they have to report in and they say, delay the traffic. This is new, this is not something that happened before. Much as I don't like snow, I wish we would have had a big snowstorm this winter to see what the effect would have been, how they would have been able to plow those streets, where they would have put the snow, because I can't even begin to imagine where they would have put that snow, and how cars would have been able to go up and down Bloor Street and police cars and ambulances and fire trucks, because it would not happen. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and I, I know the city this week was talking about raising the fines for, I think it's four hundred and fifty dollars for cars blocking intersections. Well, we could pay off the city debt if they pass that fine and send some police officers out to Bloor Street because Prince Edward and Bloor is blocked. Constantly. Yeah. Constantly. And I sent pictures with my emails. Pictures of block. No response. And I'm, I came here tonight fully believing nothing is going to change. And as some speakers said earlier, it became very clear when we started talking about 2025 to 2027. This is going to keep going. And as you said, you're only one vote in 25 or 26. However, thank you. 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 I can assure you there's a piece in there to take away. And that Happy. is, Christine, if you can make sure that you note this, that when we ask for emergency services information, we will ask for local information back from, from the actual folks. I think that's very helpful. But I appreciate the comment. Hello? Kathy, good job. And shortbread cookies are where it's at. What's that? Hi, how are you? Um, I'm Manny. I live in the neighborhood. Unfortunately, I work at the Fire Hall 431. This is why I am here. I've been brought up with amalgamation and now part of this mess. Let's stop it right there. Um, okay, so you consulted with the Fire Department. The only time we knew what you were doing was the day we got that lovely little flyer that showed up and said, Mike Lane's on the floor. Yep, that was Ooh. it. That was yes. It. <laughs> so we sat there and looked at this nonsense and we thought, hmm, how's this going to affect us? Boy, did we find out. We got our first call. Kipling and Bloor. We pulled up, pulled out of the hall, turned left, got to the lights, we found cars. We tried to turn left and we saw some more cars. And then we looked further up beyond her. And all there was was cars, which was once a very open path for us. Vehicles can't turn left because we've got an island. People can't go to the right because unfortunately there's parking and these weird little white sticks up in the air. <laughs> and then we've added all these little white cones. 
for pedestrian safety. But no, we don't give cars a place to turn for us now. So now we're sitting in traffic, turn off our sirens, occasionally release our horns, and we sit and we wait calmly, because we're polite, we're Canadians. So we sit there very calmly and we wait. And then we turn the siren back on, and we now go into head-on traffic. Because as a firefighter, you drive on your personal license. And that's something we all want to do. Drive into head-on traffic. <laughs> Hope that the other person is aware of us, that they stop, so that we can try to weave our way back in between the islands. And then we gradually make it up towards Kipling. Hallelujah! Open lanes again. And they're dead. Oh uh, yeah, man, there's nobody there. But here's the whole thing, though, is that there was no consultation amongst us. You know, there was nothing said to us that we're going to cause this mayhem for you. We now head out of the hall, we have a quick look on port, and now we take the fire truck, lights and sirens, and we go up Prince Edward Drive, next residential street. And then we turn left on King George, because you know what? Yes, Let's exactly. cause a little mayhem on King George. Because we can. We've got the lights and sirens, and, and now we've got people walking their kids to school, yep, the nannies. Absolutely. So now we're driving at 1.2 kilometers an hour. No sirens, because we don't want to disrupt everybody. And again, we'd like to thank you guys for submitting this. Because yeah, it, it made it such a wonderful thing for all of us. So instead of inconveniencing a couple of bicyclists, making them go Prince Edward across King George, let's inconvenience a fire truck. Let's inconvenience a vehicle that weighs a couple of tons, running at full kilter, and requiring them to use residential side streets. Because that makes all the sense of the world. <laughs> discussion about should they be treated all equal or should they weigh more or less. I think this is the makings of some public policy and it's really important that we're hearing this from the public. So this has been noted. Uh, and you don't have to answer this today, but what I would really like to know from a professional that is living through this, uh, what are the hard questions that I need to ask as a counselor so that I'm doing my due diligence to make sure I'm making a smart decision. You don't have to answer it on the microphone, you don't even have to answer it, but, but, my, but my point is, is there's, there's tough questions to answer people, to ask people like you that know the answers to. Council Holiday, the hard question is reality. Reality states that we are a large vehicle traveling at a quick pace to get to where we need to be. We don't have 911 for frivolity. It's not like you can call 311 and call Uber Eats. We can call for emergency services. You state that when you call, you will get the response that you require. 
If I'm stuck in traffic, maybe causing mayhem, maybe causing an accident, and on our way pushing through traffic, people panic. When they panic on Bloor Street now, where do they go? Nowhere. They go to a parked car. They go to a storm front. So I told my guys to turn the siren on because we may cause an issue that we may not be able to handle at this point. So don't put us in a position to so fail. And that's the problem. In Toronto, to put people in a position to fail. Don't let us fail. Sitting there at a red light, 
And all you can think of is how crazy the people who are making these decisions in Singapore are. civil engineer, my name is George, I live south of the tracks, so I attended the Northern Middle West, and obviously, I'm, I'm here because I'm against you. Thank you. I'm, I'm against you, but I'm against you. I'm against you. I'm against you. I'm against removing lanes, so if they do this on Bernanthorpe, with all the highway traffic coming off Highway 27, you've got six lanes probably on that freaking bridge, right? Because then you want to put it down to, to two lanes, you better not do that. You better not do it on Bloor either. Now, once upon a time, I lived in Delft, and I had a 19-month contract there, and I had two bikes. One bike to go to work, and a 10-speed for the weekend. And there was about a thousand bikes at the train station, okay? Now, uh, I used to drive my daughter to the grocery store where she had a little summer job. And I had to go along Bloor across the bridge, up to Jane, turn left, and go up to the junction to the potato grocery store. She never wanted to wake up on time either, so. Anyway. Uh, she lives in New York City now. Okay, fine, 23 year old. Uh, but anyways, my point is, uh, I hate this idea that you took away a lane. Like, that's nuts. A lot of stuff is nuts in this city. And I don't want to, now the, the traffic guy, I can't say. Mike. Uh, what's a major <laughs> arterial? How many cars do you have? It's 20,000. 20,000. I teach at George Brown College and Humber College. And I, 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 I anyways, okay. what, what about a major street? What's the traffic up? The count of cars. There has some, this was the way the city was planned. Now you want to plan it into to bike. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a bike, biker. I use the Humber River. I go down to Leslie Smith if I feel like it. And that's a long way from here. And uh, on the, the good weather, five months of the year, who the hell wants to ride a bike to, to OPG downtown where I used to work? Once I upon did. a time. So anyways, that's a lot Every of fun, but don't take away lanes on four-lane roads. <laughs> I would like to ensure everyone that that is the highest bar and the first thing that I look at when I see these proposals. Again, I'm, talk, I'm talking personally, not necessarily about what the advice that comes down from the public service is. But as far as I'm concerned, that is the beginning point of an issue. I'll go a little bit further to say this. As a member of council, my experience is going to be very similar to my colleagues around the city, especially in the suburbs. We get a lot of calls about traffic in neighborhoods and on calm, quiet residential streets. It's not lost on me, and I hope it's not lost on them, that when you disrupt a route, you cause traffic infiltration. And a great example of this uh, would be Edmonton Avenue, where they're doing construction. I can assure you, if you live near there, you know there's an uptick in traffic on all of the parallel routes, and I'm you know, quite certain Although it's out of the ward and I don't get those calls, that it's happening here. Yeah. And it's yeah. quite simply because people are feeding the arterial to take different routes. Look, I got ways, so does everybody else. But what that does is it begins to run against the very complaints that we are already getting from the neighborhood, so it doesn't square up. Doesn't. This is a point of concern, and I would invite everyone in this room, whether you're in this ward or wherever you are, to continue to press those issues. Because conventional wisdom says that when you have a problem on a quiet street, you cut through traffic, and so on, the first question you ask is what's wrong with the arterial? Why aren't people choosing that? And these are the main points of concerns that I have when really busy streets that are arterials are restricted with respect to their capacity. And that is my political answer to you. I wish more councillors took that approach. Thank you. Um, thanks for hosting this meeting, uh, Councillor Ali. Uh, my name is John. I live by Roy York in Eglinton. Uh, I'm a cyclist. I use the uh, Eglinton Trail. It's a dedicated bicycle trail. Uh, it's a great thing. Uh, 
wish there was more of them. Uh, my question tonight is, uh, just logically, I, I use Westway a lot, and you talked about uh, congestion. People are finding the other streets are congested. They're using Westway a lot. It's a four-lane uh, road, and there's, I saw that on your list. Purely from a logical perspective, and uh, I encourage you to look at the traffic, the bicycle traffic. I live in the area. I use Westway all the time. The number of bikes I've seen on Westway, I can count on one hand in the period of the year. Um, now, it's busy now because people don't want to use Eglinton. They get tied up on the 401. Westway's a busy street. Four lanes. If you take away 50% of the pavement and give it to less than 1% of the people using it, I'd like to understand the logic there. Just purely from a simple logic perspective. How does, how, how on earth does that make sense from a logical perspective? And forget about your slides, forget about your study, forget about, get out of your cubicles at the city hall, go to Westway and look at the traffic, and tell me how this makes sense. The staff have indicated to me that there isn't a development post on the Westway, but I'm glad you raised it. Uh, I know we've talked a lot about glue, but this meeting is also about things like that. Please, 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 spread the word to your neighbors. Have them give me feedback about this. I used Westway. I'm probably one of those cars from time to time. I'm sure my wife was on it, driving my son to hockey tonight. I get it. It's a great street. And I do understand the ratio of bikes. But I need people to come back and raise concerns or, or give us information about maybe what could work if it's not taking away the way. All of that is valuable and it's stuff I want to channel to the people that plan the projects and design them. So thank you for making the comment. I can't see you, but I really appreciate you coming forward. Thank you. Okay, my name is Basil. I live in Ward 3. Uh, first thing when you talk about Bloor Street is way more people use the transit than ever go on the car. So let's just keep that in mind when we're talking about the traffic here. Uh, traffic is bad. I know it from a very personal way because I work for Canada Post. I'm a letter carrier. I pick up mail at 5 o'clock in the afternoon at Bloor and High Park and then try and get back to the West Mall. There is no fast way and it's gotten worse since the pandemic. Nothing to do with bicycles. I can't move fast on a net, Dundas, Burnhamthorpe. I can't go down Parkside, go down and get on the lake shore and onto the gardener fast anymore. There's way too much traffic. And it's about to get worse. We're about to do Cloverdale Mall. Uh, Prince, uh, Prince Edward and Kingsway is about to be done. We don't have the room for all we're talking about with cars. We have to think of another way. Maybe the blur bike lines aren't being used right now, but it's at least an idea. We're trying. They're trying. No. 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 Yeah. no. no people don't like that. No. And I do have one last thing with this as well. They mentioned a little earlier. No. They mentioned a little earlier about schools. Uh, the Toronto District School Board has a specific policy to try and get children to bicycle and walk to school. A bike lane like Bloor, like the one they're talking about Montgomery, will get our most vulnerable citizens, which are children, to school better. So I'm going to turn those to the bike. So where are the letters on your bike? Excuse me, I'm listening to you. Listen to me. Deliver the letters on your bike. Park your van and ride a bike, pal, when you deliver the mail. Walk. 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 Five days a week drive along the floor as a professional driver. Take a bike! In the afternoon. Take a bike! Ride a bike, you lazy bugger! You lazy bugger, ride a bike! Actually, I drive a five ton truck. There's no way I can take a bicycle to the loop because I can work out. My parents can do it with their kids. My point is, with the amount of building that's going on in the city, we have to think of new solutions. More mail to I would like uh, more bicycles. Shut down so Canada Post! Who, who uses it? The yeah. bike thing may not be perfect, but at least it's something. And I've been in Manhattan. Her people are complaining at me. 
Uh, tell me how Etobicoke is more congested than Manhattan. It has a lot of bike lanes. And the taxi industry in New York has brought out public documents stating that they support the bike lanes through time. What's your question? We don't want to be What's your question? Please, please respect the different opinion. Because the Blur Street is back. Maybe there are a couple of good ideas. I mean, there's one, there's one that's being talked about, which is through the hydro fields, <laughs> all the way from the market room of Edmonton, yes. all the way down to the subway station. Yeah. I'd like to take it. I'd like to find people that support that so yeah, that I can go to council. That's a good idea. Here, here. Here, here. Here, here. Here, here. Um, one quick note, I don't know if I get to this, but I did see the beginnings of bike infrastructure going on in Edmonton, uh, further east, uh, up by, um, where are we, uh, uh, the other side of the game. So it looks like there's more bike infrastructure coming, it's a very narrow area there. Um, I don't know if that's part of the 2024 area. I'm going to bring that up because it's the next reason we're going to have a Speak up, please, closer to the mic. Okay, sorry, there we go. Straight on. There we go. Perfect. Okay. The things I want to ask about, though, are how do we fix this? So how do we fix the consultation process that is focused on our use of bicycles and not the consequences of bike lanes? Like it, it, the unintended consequences are why we're here tonight. You're taking away lanes, okay, for bikes. But where in your study does it talk about what you're doing to cars, what you're doing to arterial roads that were designed for cars? That seems to be completely missing in your discussion. You're talking about, well, we can put a bike lane like this or a bike lane like that. Every option, what's it doing to vehicle traffic, to the congestion of the city? Like, how do we change the consultation process so we're engaged, you hear the voices of these people, and not just the voices. You're talking, when you talk about CO2, where in your CO2 study does it say about congestion of cars and the increased congestion? Like, where's the balance in the reporting? The, the consultation needs to be better, needs to engage people, it needs to have science, and not people waving flags. So we've got to fix this. All of us have to fix this. Thank you. Uh, I, I want to make sure, Christine, we're getting these notes that I think I'm hearing it over and over again that the consideration of congestion needs to factor in with higher prominence and how council weighs these things out. You know, often they're buried in the report. There's a stat, there's a stat somewhere in the blue report that talks about delay, but it's, it's down on the list of the things that my colleagues may be looking at. I, I can't tell you what's in their head, but I can tell you it's the stat that I go to. So I, I appreciate the comment. I think these are very constructive, and hopefully we can shape some public policy based on this. Uh, up, upstairs, please. And I'm just gonna make a note, folks, if we can begin to shut the queues down, we've got to be up and running in about 20 minutes. I'll stick around a little bit here, but uh, I do I do appreciate we've got to come to an end at some point. Thank you, uh, Councilor Holliday, and thank you, City staff, for attending this evening. I'd like to make a point that I came up on a half hour late because of the traffic on Blue Street. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, when I did arrive there, I did not see a whole line of bicycles outside. In fact, I did not see a single bicycle uh, outside. So virtually everybody came here to go by vehicle or perhaps a lot of local. Number three, if you look up here, I'm wearing a bright yellow jacket. This is my biking jacket. I bike in the city. My fellow cyclists wear black all night long. They are invisible. They go through stop signs. They go through red lights. They kick vehicles. <laughs> I'm sure it's a two-way street between drivers and cyclists. They're not friendly to each other. How can we see these cyclists if they refuse to obey the law <laughs> and, and refuse to put lights on their bicycles, wear helmets, and uh, wear bright colored clothing? Mm -hmm. I don't understand. <laughs> Queensway and Shell. We're 
Street is a done deal. Dundas is next. You're, you're targeting Eglinton. Which east-west uh, artery can we have for vehicles? Now, the gentleman mentioned the right turn on red. Every single intersection is no right turn on red. It took me 45 minutes one morning to get from Royal York to make the right-hand turn at South Kingsway to go to the Gardner Expressway. I had one bicycle go by me at 9.30 in the morning. That's ridiculous. So I ask you, and everybody's mentioned this many times, what is the logic of this thinking? And then my final point is for the gentleman that was talking about, who was very pro cyclist and I, and I can understand that, we should listen to all these points of view, but what mother wants to have their six, seven, eight-year-old child ride their bike to school? They're concerned about safety. So they drive them to school. It's not going to change no matter what the cycling lobby says. You're not going to have parents dispatch their children to go to school on their bicycles or perhaps even walk. One final comment is that King George here, which is one significant block north of Bloor, runs between Wally York and, and Prince Edward and beyond, has turned into a highway. Yeah. Because people yeah. will not drive on Bloor Street. I am guilty of that. Yep. I drive on there. It's a highway with stop signs. So you go quickly, you stop. And what do we do? We consume gasoline and make greenhouse gases when we want to reduce those. So I think your bike lanes have been counterproductive in virtually every single aspect of your objectives. Thank you. I live on Kings Court Drive, so I'm right at Bloor, between Bloor and the Kingsway. My street was a nowhere street, nobody ever used it. 8 o'clock in the morning, traffic is now backed up, trying to turn onto Bloor Street, almost the entire block. I just wanted to make a couple of points about safety. The reason bike lanes are there is for the safety of bicyclists. I'd like to tell you that when I'm on Bloor Street going west, and I need to make a right turn onto any of those side streets, I'm terrified I'm going to hit a bike because I cannot see the bikes with the parked cars. That's my first point. My second point, I had to go to TD Bank on Monday. I parked my car, coincidentally, right on the white line. I didn't need to. I took pictures of it. One of my tires is touching the white line on the passenger side. My car doesn't fit. My car stuck out on the other side. If I open my door, I have to be careful I'm not gonna kill myself or, or T-bone somebody else. So the bike lanes don't fit my car. Imagine a truck. My other point is, I'm not sure if you're aware of this council holiday. I discovered this because I'm an avid walker. I walk every day. And I was walking along Bloor Street. There used to be TTC stops between Old Mill and Prince Edward. My 97-year-old mother used to take the bus. They removed the bus stops. There are no more bus stops between Old Mill and Prince Edward now. They removed them for the bike lanes. <laughs> who's not a walker, who's got a disability, who's got an issue. Yeah, yeah. Nice um, so the, the last point I just wanted to make was, we were invited to a meeting earlier, or later last year, to listen to the deal that had already been struck. Yeah. I don't remember ever being invited to a meeting to talk about the implementation of the bike lanes or what they should look like. Yeah. I'm not opposed to bike lanes. I'm cars are being forced to park on Bloor Street at great peril to the cars, the bikers, and everybody else. I really, that's what I have to say. Thank you. Good. I just want to see if we get some responses. I'm sorry, I, I can't make a comment on the meetings because they weren't in this board. But I wonder if there was any technical Answers regarding some of those pieces about parking and so on that might be helpful tonight. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so TTC, yes, thank you. So uh, TTC, we work closely with our partners in TTC. They make decisions about where the stops go, and so we coordinate with them on the design. If they're trying to uh, remove the number of stops so that the buses that do run run more quickly, that's something that they're trying to do across the There's half as many lanes to be struck. This is in the TTC's own 
new guidelines, which also go to council. Uh, there's a balance to be struck between serving every block and serving you know, every 20, you know, every kilometer. Because if you stop every block, then you can meet every house. But if you stop every block, then your bus takes forever. So they have guidelines that uh, set that decision making. And on a project like this, they take opportunities to relocate stops or remove stops. Uh, on the parking question, so that's a, a question about the design of the, the parking spaces, particularly in Kingsway. We've heard your feedback before. The, the, the um, parking lanes are of a standard width, similar to how they are in other locations on Bloor and in the city, as are the vehicle lanes. We have heard this feedback and we're taking it seriously, so we're going to look at, make, uh, at making adjustments to give uh, people parking more room and more room to the uh, vehicle lanes so that uh, when you open your car door, you're not as close to a, the moving vehicle. Just to that point, I don't know how you can make more room. You're taking away a lane, there's not enough room on the parking, the designated parking spot for my car, and then there's there's uh, cement, cement things, so I don't know how you can make more room. Okay, folks. Please, can I please? I've been waiting. Please, yep. can I? I have a question about equity. We're, we're coming there. I, I, you know, I, I think we can go right till the end if I have everyone's agreement that they'll efficiently leave the room at nine so that I don't get in trouble and the school board doesn't get in trouble. But let's go to the end. I don't think we're going to make it to everybody in the line. I'll do my best to talk to you one on one. And with that, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Anita. Um, I'm a working mother. I've got two daughters in the public school system. I, I saw that one of the criteria was equity, it was highlighted before. And I guess I have a question. I haven't really heard anyone speak on behalf of the, the young families, which we have many, many in this neighborhood, and, and the working parents. So my commute daily has now gone, it's 15 minutes more, just on that little stretch of floor, 15 minutes back, 30 minutes a day, I've been called to work downtown, two and a half hours for a working mother now, spending idling in her car. The rest in the evenings, I've got kids at the dance studio, sports, as do many other parents. We are now stuck on Bloor. It is not practical to bring kids on bikes. I wear suits and skirts to work. I cannot bike to work. When we talk about equity, where are we thinking about the hardworking families that pay the taxes in this country? but I'm going to ask staff just to articulate how the equity lens works. Just so we're clear on it, it's not what we were talking about, but at least that's able to give information. And I'll, I'll give you some context from my perspective. Um, so for the 2022 to 2024 program, the equity analysis is specific to what are called neighborhood improvement areas. Uh, these are parts of the city that the Social Development Finance Administration Division identify. When that analysis is used, it's to identify areas to receive more attention from a transportation perspective. It doesn't include the design of a bikeway, so it, it doesn't point to a street and say, this is an equity-deserving area, they must have a cycle track here. If this is an equity-deserving area, we need to understand more about what is going to make a positive difference for the people in that area. So, to give a, 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 a local context, uh, some of the neighborhood improvement areas here, forgive me if I don't get all the names right, but Islington Center, which would con continue through the Mayville area, um, Willow Ridge, which would be at the top of uh, Martin Grove near the 427 interchange, uh, and up north of the west way towards Dixon Road. And so the idea is, is to prioritize the whole of the queue of things. Uh, to think about prioritizing to those parts of the city with respect to investments. A little bit more about working families and the plight of people trying to get around the city. This is the essence of the board of the questions. You know, who, uh, who are we trying to make life easier for? Um, a great parallel example to this, something that I've fought at council over and over again, is council has been very deliberate about removing the requirements for builders to build parking spots. They've used this idea that somehow it will make housing cheaper. But my response back, and I've done this on camera, I've challenged you know, the policy makers on this, is you know, what working parent, after working a shift in a long day, needs to then try to figure out where they're going to stuff their car at 9 o'clock at night 
you know, try to make it home the tougher it is in bed. So, you know, we have to recognize that people live in different circles. Some people live in the city and they live in a small area that they can walk a short distance. And that's great for them, right? And, and that's their life. I live in a circle that's about 25 kilometers. I'm here in Etobicoke, I might be working in Etobicoke, I might be downtown, I might be in Brampton, all on the same day. Because, you know, I got a kid that plays hockey and kids that do sports, right? Uh, and some people, like, you know, my cousin lives in a 500 uh, kilometer radius because he lives in really north of the city. But there's a lack of recognition that people live different ways. And, you know, sometimes not everybody goes to the city to work. They go the other way into the Animal 5. And that's, that's the reality on the edge of the Cup, right? We're ubiquitous with the surroundings. And this is the essence of the political decisions and the struggle and the fight over congestion. I think we're ranked number three according to Tom Tom in the world. So thank you for raising the point. And it's a valid point because I think council should just be thinking about everyday people in London City. Hi, thank you very much, Councillor, and thank you very much for city staff for coming here. I'm sorry I'm not a great public speaker, so this is real awkward. Uh, I wanted to ask a question about the 25 to 27 uh, lanes for consideration. Um, I wanted to ask in the context of connectivity, so I suspect that this may be a Becky or a Katie question. Uh, there was a, one of the areas for consideration was Kipling from Lakeshore to Bloor, and then Kipling from Edmonton to Finch, which is a great highway opportunity for cycling. I'm all in favor of expanding the network. But the area from Bloor to Edmonton is currently not considered on Kipling. Uh, it was uh, the, it's considered under the Utopico Greenway or, or Martin Grove. The challenge with the Greenway is you have to cross Burnham Thorpe, Rathburn, and Princess Margaret, which presumably means you're gonna put a neighborhood crossing in there and interfere with all the cars. You also have to get up the north side of Echo Valley, which is very steep. Um, so I'm wondering uh, why Kipling from Bloor to Edmonton wasn't considered uh, when that could create like a beautiful straight highway all the way from Finch down to the lake shore and connect a ton of neighborhoods. It can connect uh, Rexdale to Etobicoke Center. It can connect uh, Humber College to uh, to Etobicoke to Center, uh, etc., etc. And so I'm wondering if, if you might be able to speak a little bit about that one and the logic behind not including uh, Kipling from uh, Edmonton to Bloor. Also, the street is in dire need. Uh, I'm going to quick response to that. This piece was not selected for this canvas piece, largely because of the network coverage category, which is trying to give more attention to areas that didn't have another option. So I know it's not right next to it, but I think, you know, looking at the map, I think Martin Grove might have been identified as being close enough to proximity that in this next near term, it was not possible to include as many routes next to ones that are currently existing when a lot of parts of the city don't have anything close at all. Thank you. Thank you. I think, uh, just a warning, we've got a seven minutes hard stop. Please go ahead. Gail, I'm going to ask a question there. Yes. I'm wondering about the influence of developers and their development on this, on these bike lanes. Because I noticed on this slide, that this wasn't approved until two, uh, 2022. And yet way back in 2020, council approved developments like the huge Tridel development that's going in, um, with a dramatic reduction in the number of car park spaces and a huge increase in the number of bicycle spaces. Now that's really to the developer's advantage. Because if you don't have to dig down, especially when a hydrology report says that the water table is high, if you don't have to use the technology and build those extra 200 or more parking spots, it's really to your advantage. So what happened there? Are the developers, did they have comment on this? Were they consulted? How did they know to reduce the number of cars and increase the number of bike? I'll, I'll give you a really short answer. Um, about a year and a half or a quarter ago, council turned the minimum parking requirement by developers to zero. That's the reality. 
It doesn't include accessible spaces and visitor spaces. For example, um, if anyone remembers where the old Jim and Lee Burgers was and the Red Cotton Burgers by Kipling Subway Station, there's a tower going up there. They essentially have no parking spaces. They have a few. But, you know, it is on top of a subway station. But this is part of the struggle and part of the answer I gave a little while ago about the reality of the total suburbs on the edge of the number five. Is there's this forever pressure of reducing the number of parking spaces, presumably because people will buy it, and great if they do. But council took a very, very strong move, and I didn't support it, I can tell you that. But, uh, you know, the outfall is, is people end up parking on the street, it creates all sorts of pressure. So, I wouldn't say that uh, developers influence these plans in that way, just because council's taken it off the table and taken it. But they may have influenced the council to pass what you just talked about, uh, zero uh, parking spaces. Oh, well, uh, they, they, I, you know, I think there's a broader policy discussion, and it's, it's probably not for tonight, and I have some strong views on it. Um, but it is what it is, and uh, I, I wouldn't draw that connection between the white players and the developers. Thank you. I think I've got one or two more. Please go ahead. I will make this as sh much shorter than it was started as. Counselor, I do not live in Brighton. I live in Topico and have for almost 40 years. I am here, as are many of the others who don't live in your riding, because we support the fact that we know that you are against this. I think that after tonight, depending on what you can show, you explained your 1 in 24. Well, this will mean nothing as a result. And what's wrong with that is the passion in this room who did elect you, who elected those of our, your colleagues who aren't thinking, and to the city staff, you do your best. It's a pat answer. You got the policy people who are getting it from the elected, and you have to do what you're doing. We're not blaming you. We're frustrated by the fact that this is what happens. Might I suggest? This is so passionate. Is there a chance that we could do an actual vote right across every single ward to say, are you for or against bike lanes in your ward? Thank you. Yes, we only had three people in here who were passionate on the other side, but the passion on all sides will be seen. Please ensure that you try and make that happen. Great. Enough for tonight because we'd be here all night to argue some of those issues, but you know what they are because they're in the newspaper, and it's when the population of the city is so far offside and council is so far offside on particular issues. They frustrate me so much. And please continue to speak out against them. That is the only way to turn the tide. Thank you for that. I think we've got one more uh, up on the balcony. It's a little round up there. Okay, uh, well, uh, my name is uh, Boris Misik. <coughs> I live in uh, Martin Wood area. Uh, that's uh, Bull Street West and uh, Mill Road. There is already, already a plan to build uh, uh, 10 new, uh, uh, new, plan, plan, new buildings. Imagine, let's say, around every of them, 15 floors. Uh, that's about a few, uh, let's say, 200 people per each, times 10. That's 2,000 new people, and who knows how many cars. And then, at the same time, you know, with that plan, they are running this plan to shrink blue to one lane, uh, one lane west, west, west east, one lane east west. So where is the, the common sense of, of, of that one? I, I, I don't get it. Also, during that development, they have to block up one lane. So when they shrink blue to one and one, which lane they, they are going, going to block? You know, what, what they are building? And that takes years. Yes, it does. Sir, I, I see a couple of things. I'm familiar with the location. There's a lot of activity happening in the Markland area. 
it is, it is with great difficulty that they close that one street, that one lane on Bloor Street because it is a very, very busy road. It's commuters that go through there. I know I deal with the school often. What I would say is the following. I have great concerns with any proposal to reduce the capacity of that artery, and I'm glad you raised it. And secondly, you have an excellent residence association in that area that I am quite certain will be involved in the conversation. And I would urge you to support them in this because I think they'll be making the same uh, concerns and questions raised because we know when our TO roads fail to perform to the level that is needed to move the traffic through, the traffic moves around on the side streets. And I think that will raise great concerns for the people that live in that community. And I expect to be having these conversations with them. Um, so with that, I, I, regret, I can't take any more questions. I would love to, I, I do this for hours, but I do have to close up the room to, uh, to meet with our partner. So I'm going to stick around. I'll say thank you to everybody tonight. And you're